Welcome to the Unlicensed Podcast. I am Caleb. As always, we've got Tassos over here. And this week, we're happy to be joined by Dimitri from Cambium Network, so Senior Director of Engineering. Uh, super pumped to have him here. We're going to talk about AFC, 6 gigahertz, uh, their 45, 4600 lines, and whatever else we get into. So we'll probably find some areas to nerd out about and things like that. <laughs> so before we do that, Casos, give the good people out there their call to action. Absolutely. Don't forget to like, listen, and subscribe to our channel right here on YouTube or anywhere you download your audio podcasts like Apple, Google, or Spotify. Dimitri, hey man, really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, like I said. Um, go ahead and give a quick intro out there to the folks that don't know you, kind of your history and uh, how you've ended up here. Sure. Um, so yeah, hi guys, hi everybody. Um so I'm with Cambium for last 10 years. I had my 10 year anniversary in April. Uh, so quite a Yay. long time. Uh, <laughs> I joined, uh, originally I joined with the original EPMP 1000 line when it was in, in its early stages. Um, and I've been working on EPMP since day, day one uh, of my life with Cambium, uh, working on different things. So now I'm leading all the uh, engineering related to the EPMP, uh, mainly the software engineering, all the all the features and everything um, uh, lies under under me, I guess. Very cool. Yeah, the EPMP line is really, I mean, taken off. We all know that uh, really popular line for the WISP market and a lot of other market as well, security markets, uh, the vision stuff and everything like that. So been really cool to see that product line grow up over the years and go from the, the multiple generations. So I guess we're up to the fourth major generation now, 4,500, yep. 4,600. Mm -hmm. So, you know, of course, the big news right now, I guess, uh, is really six gigahertz and the AFC and stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of nuance in everything using the AFC, whether it's a channel selection, the power levels, the spectral density and stuff like that. So might be a good opportunity here to kind of run through those details and because uh, there's just still seems to be a lot of confusion. Yeah, it's pretty new. Yeah, people are just now getting their feet wet and stuff like that. But, you know, I know there's some hot points that you sort of hit on in the forums and stuff. So maybe kind of give us a run through about what's really different with the AFC using six gigahertz and how it kind of differs from like what we're typically using used to with using five gig in the WISP world. Right. So the the AFC and six gigahertz. Um, first and foremost, that uh, the, the, the the whole thing uh, for the six gigahertz, it's it's new. It's so called unlicensed. But it developed relatively quickly and it has been mm, changing over the year that we developed the whole thing. Meaning it all started with FCC basically telling everybody, okay, we're gonna make it unlicensed. But back in the day, nobody knew what are the rules. So we're like, okay, uh, we, we have to do the unlicensed radio for the six gigahertz, but we don't know the rules. That, that's when we started developing the platform. So the, the platform development started without any official rules or guidelines. And the guys with the Wi-Fi Alliance Win Forum, they are there behind the rules, who actually proposed them to FCC eventually, and the FCC gave a green light um, for for the whole operation of the radio itself, of the AFC system, which is automatic frequency coordination thing, um, and that that's why you see many many things coming from the Wi-Fi world, because it was meant for Wi-Fi, not for the fixed wireless, uh, on one side. And that's why, for example, you see things like the external GPS pack uh, on our product, which was not originally meant and it was optional when we started the whole development. So maybe maybe you have guys questions and uh, you obviously into 6 gigahertz now, right, with their RF elements and uh, um, you are involved. Yeah, for sure. We definitely have a, a vested, a vested interest uh, in what the radios are doing. You know, we're making antennas. We've now announced our six gig antennas, and we're releasing those now. Finally, so yay! Very excited. But um, 
you know, I think a lot of people are confused what the AFC actually does. Like you said, it's unlicensed, right? Uh, and a lot of people mm-hmm. think it's a, a license mechanism or a light license mechanism similar to CBRS. But as we all know, that's not the case. You know, it is still fully unlicensed. Uh, and it really exists to protect the incumbent users of that band, who are your primarily your microwave, your part 101 links that are coming from, you know, it could be uh, internet service providers. It could be telcos, selcos public service, the county, private business. I mean, you know, just about anyone could run a licensed link in that six gig band. So, and they've been, been been put up in the air for years and years and years. So maybe wider channels up to 60 megahertz wide, lots of small little channels, which I think really surprises people when they start running uh, the AFC to see what's out there. But so the AFC was made and it's basically uh been defined and operating so that people can use a lot of this unused space and unused spectrum excuse me that's out there but not walk on top of those licensed incumbent users so you know from a from a radio perspective it seems pretty easy you're like oh well, we just have to look at the database <laughs> and pick a channel but <laughs> there's a little bit more that kind of kind of goes into that in the background of stuff so and maybe you can sort of shine some light on that i guess cuz you know like i said and, the rules are made, but there's still, I don't know, it seems like there's a bit of ambiguity still. You know, there's not like a lot of highlight spreadsheets. Because we're just used to just being able to either, it's licensed and you're, here's your channel, or it's unlicensed and you do whatever. But that's not the case. So you're you're absolutely right. It's unlicensed. It's not like CBRS. CBRS was meant for the frequency coordination. So AFC is not. It is not coordinating the unlicensed users by any means. So... Uh, when the radio goes to the server uh, and asks for the available frequency channels, and we will get there what, what, what's actually server tells the radio. Um, but um, it, it doesn't record that you are using specific channel. It will not uh, tell, okay, uh, Tassos is using this specific channel on this tower. Uh, that's not how it meant to work. It's just checking that there are no any um, incumbent links. Uh, And uh, by the way, one of the frequent users of incumbent links, uh, of the incumbent, are the TV operators. They used to do a lot of point-to-point links in 6 gigahertz back in the days, I guess. Uh, Most of them are non-operational, but they still hold the the licenses. so yeah, that, that that that's the main difference between AFC and CBRS, that it is not coordinating any users. It's just protecting the the ones who has the license and checks the di- database of those links. It's available. It's public information, by the way. So you can go to the FCC website and find all the links around your area and maybe even find out who actually is using it there. Um, so. Going back to the to the what radio is getting from the AFC server, so the the input uh, what what the the radio sends to the AFC are the coordinates. So the radio has to send GPS coordinates, and that's the only allowed mechanism right now. So you can only get GPS coordinates. There are no any other ways. Uh, to do this, and originally I, I spoke that those rules were going for for a year in discussions. Uh, there was a discussion. Maybe the like installer can put those in, like a professional installer uh, can put the GPS coordinates somewhere in the UI, and they will be transmitted to the AFC. But FCC was uh, very skeptical. Like, oh, you're gonna cheat. <laughs> um, so we, we 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 don't want this. Um, and the the only source uh, of trusted information is GPS. Uh, and they made us to prove it that you cannot cheat the 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 GPS coordinates. So the radio sends the GPS coordinates to the AFC. Um, and it's X, Y, Z coordinates. So it's on the, on the surface of the earth and it's also the height, uh, of the antenna. Um, and based on this information, AFC does all the calculation, checking the database, the, does the Fresnel zone, uh, simulation, checking if the, uh, 
like in Ghostbusters, they don't cross the beams and uh, stuff like that. <laughs> um, and it gives you back not the channels that you can use, but the information about the spectral density of your power that you can use on specific uh, frequencies. And these data is per megahertz. So you have the, for each of the megahertz, uh, it gives you the power spectral density that your radio can set up and use on this specific megahertz. So if you have like a 20 megahertz channel and you have a one megahertz with this one spectral density and the others with, with a higher spectral density, basically you fall down to the to the minimum one uh, spectral density in the in the middle. Um, and then this spectral density is uh, calculated uh, into the specific transmit power for the wider bandwidth. Um, and that's, that's where it becomes tricky. Because uh, the, the way how the power spectral density, because with the, with the wider channel, uh, you have with the same, let's say, uh, 10 dBm transmit power. With the wider channel, you have less spectral density because the same power is dispersed across the wider channel. Um, and because we are getting this power spectral density, the eventual transmit power will be higher with the, with the wider channels. So going from the 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz, you can get your 3 dB of higher transmit power on this channel eventually. And that's how it works. I hope it makes sense, guys. It's definitely a little different. The first time you play with the, the radio GUI or like the, the tool that you guys put out, which is a really neat tool, right? You're like, wait, why is my power going up when my channel gets wider? Like it's very counterintuitive, right? You're like, why right. can I run more? But, you know, the only thing the AFC cares about is interference on that link and just the raw power from a, a per megahertz basis, I guess, right? So they don't really care what you're doing with it. It's just a pure raw power calculation that they're concerned with. And then it has to be converted into with the radio, how you interface with the radio, right? Because there is no PSD setting in a radio. Mm -hmm. You can't really define it for, you know, every single megahertz across the, the channel. So you have to set a, a fixed output rate. And then, you know, hopefully if it's clear, you'll be able to run that max 36 dB ERP, you know, that you hopefully can for the, the standard power devices. But it can really vary. It really just kind of depends on, you know, what's nearby, how big the channel is and where that chunk is. You know, if that chunk is a 10 megahertz incumbent shot that's just sliced up nowhere, you know, it really affects what you do if you're trying to pick a 20 or a 40 or an 80 megahertz channel across that space. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, you know, you talked about uh, the, in the background, the AFC is doing all its calculations to, you know, make sure you mm -hmm. don't cross streams, right? Or, or your paths mm -hmm. aren't the same. So how, how are they getting azimuth with GPS data, right? So you know where this device is in space, you know, um, but you don't know where it's pointing. So how do you know it's not pointing, you know, into the path of an incumbent, across the path? away from from the path where does that come from if it's supposed to be trusted and not manually entered on azimuth yeah th th that's a great question and um re remember i mentioned that everything is coming from the wi-fi world all the regulations around six gigahertz and that that's exactly where the whole regulation coming from with Wi-Fi, they assume that every antenna is a dipole omnidirectional antenna. So that's and where the 6 dB omni thing comes from. That, that's the thing, yes. And uh, answering your question, the AFC, they don't know where, if you are using highly directional antenna, if you use a horn antenna, if you use a dish antenna, they don't really care. They just assume that you are blasting all around. Um, and uh, we and other, I believe other companies uh, in fixed wireless space, um, they made their own comments on the on this regulation. And the agreement was kind of a soft agreement that, okay, we will come back to this later once we, we open up the floodgates of 6 gigahertz. So 
potentially it can be yeah it, it should work better if you know the exact azimuth of the antenna exact antenna pattern because mm, yeah you're not assuming your blessing all around you yeah because this also kind of leads into uh something that came up on facebook and people were talking about that i didn't realize so we so we knew that there was a lot of let's say drama behind the requirements for the GPS on the subscriber side, right? So sorry, fine, whatever. Um, but it, I mean, you know, I need you to confirm this, right? Because this is what people were talking about. But mm -hmm. it, it also seems that the channel or 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 power density allowed on the CPE side is also regulated. Uh, by the AFC, and now this is creating a problem because you might have, <laughs> you know, a usable channel or or, or the, the power uh, limits on the CPE side that you're looking for on the channels that you want to operate don't match mm -hmm. those that are usable on the AP side, so you get some sort of mismatch. What good is it if you have channels A, B, and C on the AP side, let's say, as an example, but you can only use D, E, and F? right on the cpe side you know how does that it, work it, it, yeah th that's right so it's a uh you you can end up with the mix and match so let, let, let's let's do a step back a little bit so um fcc and it's not fcc it's actually wi-fi alliance and uh, win forum the two organizations behind the regulations they came up with the two uh different modes for the sm and again, everything is more or less coming from the Wi-Fi world. Uh, one they called fixed client, and another one they call standard client. And they, I, you, these are the worst names you can come up with because it's easily. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you can distinguish the two because they don't make any sense. Those names. So basically, the the standard client mode, uh, it, it is like a default mode for Wi-Fi. Uh, for Wi-Fi cli clients like your iPhone. So it assumes that um, you are getting the same power as the access point minus 6 dB, the same ERP minus 6 dB. And the logic behind it was, uh, okay, you are Wi-Fi, you probably short range, so you should be more or less in the same area as the Wi-Fi access point. So if you fall back 6 dB lower than the AP, the incumbent should be protected. So that, that's, the, that's the idea behind the logic. And it's called standard client. And EPMP supports the standard client uh, as well. And for standard client, you don't need the GPS pack. So if you use the 4625 right now without the GPS pack, it will fall back into the standard client mode. So if on the AP, you pick the frequency, you are blasting your 36 dBm ERP, uh, the SM will do 30 dBm without GPS or anything. So now the question is, what, what if I would like to go further, right? I would like to get maximum out of my link, right? I, I would like to improve my uplink signals, uplink modulations. Uh, so what can I do? Or maybe even get longer distance because of that. So you need a GPS on the subscriber and it should work in so-called fixed client mode. So the fixed client mode assumes that you are not moving around. You are not the phone itself. Um, you have like a fixed stationary client that knows its GPS coordinates. And in this case, this client can go to the AFC, provide those coordinates, and ask for its own power spectral density limitations. Uh, and AFC will calculate what this client will interfere with. Again, assuming it has omnidirectional antenna, etc., but it can get its own power density. And potentially, you can get the power spectral density higher than 30 dBm, um, up to 36 dBm with the fixed client. On the flip side, potentially you can get the power that is lower than that, and it can be even like 16, 10 dBm if there is you are unlucky and you have the incumbent link next to your subscriber. So that that's the story with the with the GPS and uh, how it works on the SM.
And by the way, ju just one one other comment in the in the latest software that we have, uh, which is five seven one, we automated the procedure. So right now in the five seven one, the SM will automatically pick the the best power between the two modes. So if the power that uh, you are getting from the AFC is uh, high, uh, higher it will use the AFC power, otherwise it will fall back into the standard client mode. So in that case, your, I guess, worst case ERP would then be 30, right? Because if it falls back well, to the standard 6 power dB mode. Well, 6dB lower than the AP. So if the AP okay. received the 6dB uh, lower than the AP. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So I guess in consideration too, like your channel selection on your AP is generally going to be more limited because of the height, right? Because the height plays mm -hmm. into it. So, you know, if you figure your AP is up at 100, 200, 300 feet, most of your CPEs are going to be at 20 feet or 20 whatever 30, it is. Yeah. Then mm -hmm. generally... You know, and it's a relatively small geographic area. It's not like we're doing 10 miles lengths like we used to do back in the day, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, then, you know, probably you're you're going to be okay and the AP is going to be the sort of limiting factor. But it's, it's kind of hard until you get many thousands of clients and can kind of pull the data sets and see what it looks like, too. So... Uh, I did some analysis. Uh, basically, I picked the 1,000 towers from America Tower from the area around me in Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Uh, so like Midwest. And we are pretty flat uh, overall. And ran like random inquiries for those locations on the spectral density. And it is, it is not that bad. Um, the, there are some locations that uh, has limited number of channels, but in the majority of cases, you can get plenty of spectrum on the AP side. And again, I consider it, uh, I don't remember what, what exactly was the height of the antenna, uh, the tower in each of the locations, but it was like 50 meters or something like that. Yeah, I think it's really important. Just don't assume that you either are going to or not going to have issues right i mean i've seen people yeah you know, i've talked to people that do have issues and then mm -hmm. i've talked to a lot of people are like oh we expect to have a lot of links and interfering and channel selection and it turns out to be wide open right again yeah because mm -hmm. it's not just wisps they're like well there's no other wisps running around me i'm like these are not just wisps these are like you said tv studios and and public safety and i've put up in a past life i mean i've had some tower sites where there were no free pairs to run any more licensed six gig because we had a whole ton of them because it's a relay site mm -hmm. so Yep. If you're there, you're probably getting no channel availability or at least very <laughs> low output. So, you yep. know, it's always good to check that the tool that you guys put out, we'll put a link to in the description or here or somewhere. I don't know. It'll happen at some point. If not, just Google uh, can be an AFC planning tool and you'll figure it out. But, um, you know, if you're curious about an area or whatever, check it out. Like it's, it's a really slick setup. And uh, ju just to add, again, based on our Obviously, we cannot check each and every location in the United States, but based on the limited amount of data that we already collected from, from the customers, uh, the most challenging places are typically across, um, not across, along the shoreline on the West Coast. Um, and the, the other typically challenging places are on top of different mountain tops. Because as you said, these are like relay stations, and many times these are relay stations for the again for the local TV guys and the, basically everybody. Uh, so those are the most challenging places. And if you are on top of the mountain or somewhere in the mountains, the chances are that you will have limited number of channels. The going yeah into the plains, you you should be better in terms of the channel selection. Yeah. So there's definitely there's definitely a lot. Uh, a lot more variables out there that have to be considered and, you know, what channels you can pick. You know, when you look at how 5 gigahertz is deployed versus 6 gigahertz, I mean, luckily the AFC kind of makes those decisions for you, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of shows you what you can and can't use and what power uh, you can and can't use, what have you. So that's that's nice that it does it, but it's definitely, I think it definitely takes a different mindset on, when you're trying to go into an area and deploy six gigahertz, you have to look at it in a different way than you would with five gigahertz, you know? 
well, the the other tool to mention that um, we do have AFC functionality incorporated in our link planner. Oh. Um, so you you can get this the the data. So this is where it makes it not very much different from everything else that we do with Cambium with the five gigahertz, because you you can take the link planner and see do the the proper planning and. Uh, like a side comment, uh, I'm still uh, I, I'm wearing the Cambium shirt, but you you don't have to use it for Cambium <laughs> uh, devices. Uh, so uh, you 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 can use it for any any radio to check for the for the radio planning, pretty much. So Link Planner. Link Planner is an awesome tool. Like I haven't done the engineering side of things in several years now at this point, but I used to use it all the time. So Link Planner is a really awesome tool, you guys. If you're not using it, uh, you should definitely use it because it is awesome. Really good, especially if you're in that uh, Cambium ecosystem, uh, planning, sector planning, details, notes, sharing with support, um, or if you've got other people working on your stuff, right? It's like, oh, send me a KMZ with all your stuff so I know where everything is. Like mm -hmm. just things like right. that. Pretty handy. So. Yeah. I'll throw a plug in there for you. It's just, it's so, and I guess sort of last question talking about, you know, or actually two questions real quick I had. So, uh, so for channel selection, you know, we always used to say, oh, use the smallest channel that you can on five gig, right? From an mm -hmm. interference perspective. And then also, again, the PSD, right? Because you were not spreading that power out. But, you know, do you think with uh, in six gig, like maybe, you know, 40 megahertz or 80 megahertz, that ends up being some sort of sweet spot? Do you think you'll see a lot of people running 20s and micro pops? I mean, you know, what, what have you seen from the data so far or general feedback? you know what people are doing in channel selections right so uh i believe that they and it's overall the the demand for the capacity and for bandwidth it's over the roof right through the roof and everybody wants to squeeze as much as as you can from the spectrum in terms of the throughput so long story short that yeah go into the wider channels and because they provide the uh, higher uh, uh, ERP potentially is a good thing. The the one that I would probably recommend to stay away is 160. You don't have that much of them. And although everybody thinks that, oh, 6 gigahertz is clean, uh, it is not, unfortunately. <laughs> so, and it won't be for uh, long, so... <laughs> yeah, so you, you can follow all the rules, all the incumbent uh, protection and everything, but still we know that the there are a bunch of other vendor radios uh, out there. Some of them are not very legal and uh, legally imported in the United States and stuff like that that they are out there. So long story short, you said absolutely right. The uh, So 40 is the new 20, and 80 is the new 40, uh, what it used to be, and the, these are the sweet spots. Okay, definitely. Okay. Very cool. And the last little nerdy sort of, I guess, AFC question that I had. So the GPS, going back to the GPS puck. So we see that question mm -hmm. a lot. Um, they're like, well, can I just use some other kind of GPS puck or, you know, I found this one off of Alibaba or whatever else. But mm -hmm. right now it seems like the requirements to use the certified puck are pretty hardcore, right? Because of the, the signature, I'm sure it's some, like some sort of signature it does with the information, the AFC or something. So if you want to shed a little bit more light on that, I think it would be helpful for people because I've seen that question yeah. pop up a lot. So. FCC was very careful about your location, again, to protect the incumbent. So they were challenging all the data that we have in terms of the GPS accuracy. And as you said, uh, we need a very, very specific GPS receiver that has been certified. Because apparently not every GPS made equal. Mm. And the accuracy of those GPS coordinates can be different from the device to device, model to model. Uh, and that, that's why we, we've been pretty much forced to, to specify a very specific puck, go to the lab, test this puck, uh, test what's the GPS accuracy of this puck. Um, and when the radio sends the data to the AFC, it provides the accuracy as well. So, for example, we certified the the radio with the accuracy of uh, 
plus minus 20 feet uh, on the XY coordinates. And we, we supply those accuracy to the AFC. So the AFC, it doesn't assume that we are in a specific location. It knows the ellipse of the, of the location on the Earth. So it assumes I can be in any of those locations. Uh, plus minus uh, 10 feet. Um, and that, that's why you cannot use the third-party GPS antenna. Uh, we hope that this FCC will ease out the the requirements for the GPS, but that that's what we have for for now. Yes. Um, and what what we saw based on this, so because we we sent this accuracy uh, for the x x y and z coordinates, um, and z by the way for GPS it's it's the most challenging one. Uh, to get the accurate uh, Z coordinate, your height. Um, yeah, so it's, it's the most challenging coordinate. So depending on the accuracy of the Z coordinate, you can get basically your height, you can get different AFC answers and going higher if it was not accurate enough and GPS returned you the inaccurate coordinates. Uh, you can get worse AFC results. And we've seen it in the field. It is not very common, but we've seen it in the field that during the time GPS returns slightly different results, like plus minus 10 feet on the Z coordinates, and you are getting different AFC results and you are ending up with the different uh, power spectral density on a specific channel, and uh, radio basically falls back couple dB, 3 dB, 6 dB, uh, just because of the GPS accuracy. Again, it's not a common story. It doesn't happen very often, but for some locations, it, it can potentially happen. Um, so if you see that the radio changed the, uh, the output power, the chances are that it gets the lower uh, transmit power because of that from the AFC. So, I mean, none of these things are cambium specific either right so i mean this would probably be the same challenge as any six gigahertz uh, manufacturer that uh, is required to use gps would run into right that's absolutely right this, this is not G, the cambium specific or epmp specific it's just the nature of the gps and the way how the afc is working which the whole thing is freaking hilarious if you consider that we're doing all these calcs based on GPS coordinates that are in the ULS for these license links, uh, some of which have a very uh, wide degree of accuracy uh, variability. Let's put it that way. Let's, I've tracked down <laughs> links to do maintenance on or planning and stuff, and then they're like, oh, here's the coordinates from ULS. And you're like, dude, that court, that tower is a quarter mile away when you go and search it out, right? And they're like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. a 207 feet, and you laser it, and it's like, I don't know, 190, 215, you know, it's yeah. just... So we're basing like super detailed, accurate, automated accuracy to something that uh, was some GPS coordinates that Jim Bob converted in 1985 when they put yeah, up this say, like ISDN link. Ago, yeah, exactly. Ago. So it's, yeah, it's, it's it's ridiculous. Using like a paper map, probably or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And he drew some lines. He's like, the tower is mm -hmm. here, and I'm like, dude, that's a Walmart. So the tower is <laughs> 300 yards over that way. So yeah, yeah. Good times, good times. So, mm -hmm. okay. So, that was kind of hammering through some uh, some some deep back end questions. AFC, which is super important. I guess we can step back a little bit uh, and talk a little bit more about the radio side of things. Um, you know, the the fourth gen of the EPMP platform. We basically have the forty five hundred and the forty six hundred series. Um, and people are like, oh, it's the same thing. It's just different frequencies. And it's like, well, I mean, kind of yes, kind of no, and things like that. So uh, I think it might be a good opportunity here to kind of go over some details, maybe clear up some uh, misconceptions about similarity and differences between the two, maybe. Or not. I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's right. So the um, as you mentioned, that's our official fourth generation of EPMP. Um, and um, th this is based on the Wi-Fi Wi-Fi six, which is eight zero two dot eleven AX. 
Um, and that's exactly what makes it common between 5 and 6 gigahertz. They, they are based on the same generation of chipsets. Uh, the thing is that if you open them up, they, they, they are different, meaning they, they are using different chipsets, uh, different models of the chipsets. Um, and uh, the RF front end is different. So they, they are less in common than, for example, EPMP 1000 and the EPMP 2000. So they, they were way more in common, although they, they are two different gen generations of EPMP uh, than EPMP 5 gig and the EPMP 6 gigahertz APs. So they, 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 are, they are different. So every time we develop certain features, many times, not every time, but many times, we have to do it like two times for one platform and for the another other platform. Um, and yeah, they, they, they are different. And uh, because of the 6 gigahertz, because of the AFC, because of many, because of, again, the, the different silicon, physical silicon is different. Uh, and the underlying architecture of the silicon is different. Uh, they, they are not the same. And the point I'm trying to make that don't expect that if you saw something and experienced something on 5 gig, it will automatically translate to 6 gig and vice versa. The, this is not how it works. And don't extrapolate because both of them have the EPMP naming on it. It, it doesn't have to. So, for example, yeah, you will not have these power limitations, for example, on the 5 gig, as you have on the 6 gig. But, but do the platforms, let's say, uh, functionality port between each other? So, for example, if you get TDD to work on the 4500, does that mean you just take that code, plop in the 4600 and make it work? Or is there other things that have to happen in order to, to make it work? Cross platform. Yeah, cross, many times we, we, we have to. Yeah, many times we have to do the specific cases uh, again, especially when it boils down to these like radio specific implementations, like very close to the RF media. We have to do it like two times. Uh, things like SNMP web interface, they 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 are shared and they are common. But when it goes down to the to the more RF things. Uh, yeah, we, sometimes you have to do it like two times, uh, separately for the five gig and separately for six gigahertz. So I can give you an example right now. We're doing the beamforming, uh, development and we are doing some alpha tests right now as we speak. And, uh, for, for this feature, you, you, you had to do it like slightly, slightly different. Something is in common, but you, you have to slightly different, uh, implementation between the five and six gig. Yeah, I mean it's also different too because you're talking about four chains on the forty six hundred versus eight chains. That's on the 4, another one. Yeah, that, that's, that's a, a very good one. Good point. Yeah. So for the and again, it's a limitation of the of the chipset itself. Uh, so we ended up with the four chains on the on the six gig and the eight chains on on five gig. Um, Saying all that, I still expect, so one of the very common, and frankly, I, I like this scenario uh, a lot, um, installation of the EPMP 3000 was with the 2x2 APs. Uh, when you plug it into the uh, either twist, twist port adapter or something like that, and you have like a high density of 2x2 APs, uh, and we've seen, I think, like 12 APs on the tower and maybe even 16 APs on the tower. Um, so it's a, it's a really neat uh, way of getting the high-density uh, towers. Uh, so, yeah, um, going back to the number of channels, yeah, they, they are different. 5 gig is 8 chains, uh, and it's a sector, an uh, sector antenna by default, and we just recently released the connectorized version of it so you can connect all the third-party antennas you know they're uh with 3000 primary i guess or 3000 main ap 3000 l you know there was a lot of people mm -hmm. that chose to deploy they would deploy both of them or different methods right so you see a lot of people that are like okay i'm just going to use the four by four and i guess this would apply on like 4600 mm -hmm. for instance right you have the primary 4x4 on that which will be popular for density and stuff but i suspect there's gonna be a lot of people using um the 400l the 2x2 whether it be for slicing it up 
into, you know, 12 or whatever it is, or the area that you need to cover it, or micropops. You know, you see a lot of micropops, uh, especially with us, people in our ecosystem as well, because it's such a clean install, right? So two by two radio, twist port, horn, and then maybe we see more of those than others typically would. I, I'm surprised we haven't seen them at that scale yet. I, I was expecting people to go through the same route as they did, like a five gig. And I, I, I don't see this uptick of the of the two by two APs because it's going to be like natural from the both planning standpoint, how you plan your network, um, how you plan your APs. So yeah, I, I bet we're going to see more of those. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think a, a lot of it has to to do with, I don't want to say the misconceptions of multi-user MIMO and beam forming and, and you know, multi-chain, right? So it's like, it's like people, because because the platform is available in a 4x4 or an 8x8, that's what they want, right? I mean, this is this is one of the biggest things that always gets me, and we've, we've seen, Caleb is and it? I have worked with so many WISPs, you know, and it's not, you know, to to say the platforms don't work, but let's say, you know, look like the Medusa, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we know that the capabilities of, you know, uh, the 16 by 16 in there and, you know, talking to eight clients at the same time, multi-user MIMO works, but there's a lot of variables that are needed in order for it to utilize that that entire uh, spectral efficiency and talk to all those clients. And, and a lot of the... Uh, wisps that we have talked to said, you know, that they're not seeing the that order of magnitude of density and that ability. So it was, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, maybe they were able to talk to two or three clients at the same time because they didn't have all their customers in, in the perfect spots that they need to be in order to utilize the maximum capability of multi-user MIMO. And for, you know, people were finding out that it's, you know, a lot easier and cheaper to go with you know, two or three two by two radios covering the same 90 degree azimuth than, you know, uh, a, a platform that has a higher magnitude, right? So, you know, during COVID, you know, a lot of networks were built out with two by two radios and, you know, narrow beamed horns or narrow beamed antennas to get that density that you need. And yeah, I'm still surprised that the 4500L, the 4600L, you know, aren't being deployed in greater numbers, you know, because they they don't have the the, the you know the require the technical requirements to make beam forming work right and multi user MIMO to work. I mean, they they pretty much are are working right now, uh, and they can go out and build some really dense networks today. Uh, and let's see where you know the four by four, eight by eight, when it comes and when it's mature and ready to go, then you deploy them later. So I think a lot of people are waiting for these other platforms and, you know, hopefully, hopefully they, they come, but you know, a lot of networks were built with two by two radios and still, still are, you know? Yeah. It's really just going to be, and a lot of it turns into Ford Chevy conversations too. It was the same thing with 3000 and 3000 L, you know, Mm -hmm. it's some people were only deploying this way. Some people were only deploying that way or a mix. So, you know, now that the horns, especially on the six gig, we're rolling out with those. Finally, uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of those sort of, Micropop 4600 L cases and stuff, and uh, really curious to how that goes, especially considering your overall, you know, radius because the power levels are kind of not limited, but they're not what they were. You don't have the unlimited gain on the CPE side, and you're traditionally trying yeah. to run these on you know, higher modulation rates. So they're faster networks on wider channels and stuff. So your, your radiuses are typically going to be shorter, more dense, which means more less layout. So I don't know. I'm really curious to see how it, how it bakes out. Right. So definitely. I mean, it's a, it's a deployment strategy that WISPs understand. They've been doing it for years now. It works, you know? And yes, speaking of density, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's a very, well, it, comes up very often to the density <laughs> <Yeah>. discussions <laughs> but yeah you're absolutely right and uh well we can um, we as campion we can take a look at the like cn meister data and we as industry we have nice uh, reports from pre um, exactly and what what we are seeing that with any technology with any it doesn't matter which radio 
uh, the density typically it is not that high. We are talking about right. like a, from dozen to twenty SMs. That's your typical installation, and uh, one can say I can only already imagine somewhere uh, one of the comments that oh yeah uh, I have uh, an AP with a 120 SMs 100 200. subscribers yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, uh, no ifs and buts you can find these type of spots yeah. my, my point sure. is that they are not this is not your common installation correct this is not your common scenario uh, the mo and again, it's not because uh, I'm just looking at Cambium data. That's that's the industry data with any radios, uh, and it's not due to the radio limitations. It's due to the like physical limitations. You don't either have clients in this area, or you don't have like a distance long enough to cover this area because of the like physical limitations of the media, not because of the specific radio. Um, and that's it. It it limits your scalability, and I I totally get it. The, there are there are APs that needs it, where you have tons of clients. You need to connect all of them with the high speed, no ifs and buts. But don't think only about this scenario. You all you also have all the other scenarios you have to cover in your network. Yeah, I mean, and that's you know that that comes down to the the right tool for the job. Right, so that, it, it, that's in, my in the area mm -hmm. where you need or you you can successfully have hundred plus subscribers in a ninety degree azimuth for a single AP, yes, you know, then you know there are platforms out there that are for that. But yeah, I mean, in in my experience, is you know like seventy five percent of the install base is all based on this dozen or two dozen clients per mm -hmm. AP, and that's and that's the way it works out, and it just seems like. You know, it's it's a a much more cost effective deployment strategy for Wisps to go with a, an access point that costs a few hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or something, and have a couple of those up versus something that costs ten or fifteen thousand dollars that gives you this incredible capacity that will never be utilized. You know, um, but you know, everybody always wants what's there. I mean, the the, the genie's been let out of the bottle. Because the spec sheets have been out for so long saying, yeah, 125 concurrent subscribers, you know, four or five concurrent subscribers can be communicated at the same time, which is high spectral efficiency. So all these things that delivering one plus gigabits of throughput, you know, that it's hard to, you know, to, to, to absorb that, you know, years ago now, right? This platform has been, been in, 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 in development for two plus years, you know? So they, they hear that, they want that, they mm -hmm. expect that, they're waiting for that, um, you know? And it's just, and I, yeah, it's, it's I, I totally get it that that makes total sense. Uh, that, that's what your, your expectations are. But right. my, my point is just don't be discouraged if uh, it doesn't meet all the high expectations uh, in hmm. each and every circumstance. And the, in each and yeah. every setup, it, it doesn't mean it will limit you uh, with their. And again, it's it's not only me talking Cambium. It's it's the generic recommendation with any any technology. Try to think business. If it if it makes for you, if it generates the revenue, can you generate the revenue? Uh, that that should be the one. What's your uh, ROI? What's your return of investments? What's your uh, value eventually of, of this whole enterprise? The, and if you can get the value out of it. Yeah. I mean, there's over 800 megahertz of spectrum just waiting there and people mm -hmm. are standing by waiting for something else, you know? So <laughs> on the topic of sort of spicy conversations, I guess. So, uh, you know, it's been, been a lot of heat in various forums and stuff like that. Uh, I guess you guys are getting beat up a little bit on that. Any good um, Facebook posts lately? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Speaking of Facebook and stuff like that, <laughs> uh, I do want to point out the, you know, there's a place to figure things out talk to people, but there's a place where you can more uh, directly interact and, and different companies do it differently, right? So yeah, we're a hundred percent like social media, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, we do it, but we don't really, I mean, we have the RFE lab, but most everything sure. we do is, you know, pretty much social based, right? Mainly because Tassos likes to argue with people and whatever else. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you guys have got the community. And I think it's important to note here that, you know, when you're, when you're wanting to get more sort of detailed to the point information, uh, your guys' community forms, probably uh, a more direct, uh, place to to get more accurate sort of timely data i guess would put that mildly i don't know yeah that, that, that that's right and uh, uh i enjoy all the all the forums and discussions uh on both facebook on our community but the the goal of those tools um is to have a healthy discussion between the the professionals in the field and many times not the vendors itself um yeah you probably guys are the the exception um can be we we don't have it in our dna to be like a um, public uh, this type of uh, social media organization and uh, the way how we operate typically um or th that's the generic message we Unfortunately, we cannot provide support uh, through the Facebook or even our community. These are not the, the methods how we provide support to our customers. Uh, because for us, it's really difficult to track all the, all the requests. And many times, uh, you know that very well, they are not detailed right in the it's they many times they are emotional and i totally get it i'm getting emotional on facebook as well so uh, that, that's the place where you go to be emotional right uh, or reddit or twitter these days uh but uh that, that's not how to get the support so my my typical recommendation uh especially when you start using the new technology and it's not it's not about cambium only but if you're using the new technology, if you're using the new device, you are facing challenges, uh, please go to our support. I know that it is additional work because you, you have to figure out, try to recall your Cambium password and stuff like that. Uh, you have to provide some additional information. It, it, it feels like additional work, uh, but eventually it will work out for both of us meaning it will we can um, systematically help you as cambium as organization um, and we can uh, give these again systematic feedback from you because it's really difficult uh, to the best as i can for example and uh, the other guys you know like further he's helping a lot on, on the community uh, to collect this data from the community, it, it is difficult, especially when you would like to get some technical details. Like the, the number one thing we are looking for, like, oh, technical support file, right? And you will probably never share technical support files for the public on Facebook. Um, so um, please go to the, to the support. Please raise a ticket. And we as EPMP team at the end, overall cambium we are pretty open so if you are a customer of cambium you should know your sales manager uh if you are having a challenge send him a message like oh that's my ticket can you please uh, keep your eye on this uh, uh support ticket um, so i i am not that public but i'm accessible meaning i'm on facebook i Will be, I can leave my uh, email easily, and I typically give my email to everybody on uh, like Wispapalooza and everything. And I, I actually do answer emails, so I don't ghost people typically. <laughs> and uh, so just just reach out. That, that's my overall message. Just reach out, and we we will try to help you. And we we are doing this a lot, by the way. Yeah, the uh, RSM, RTM sort of structure that you guys have, you know, which is it's unique. I'm not going to say unique to the industry, but uh, I mean, it really kind of is, right? You know, so I think once there's so many people that are new to your ecosystem that are, you know, because of 
the 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 next gen platform, right? You're you're picking up a lot of new people who aren't necessarily used to the uh, the optimized way of doing things, perhaps, or you know, it's just a new and system, th- new th- things. That's a very and- good point. The even to add to this, you said that there are um, a lot of new people, and we see a lot of brand new customers, both to EPMP and Cambium with the six gears. And this world, that's completely new for them. They are not familiar with the frequency reuse, for example. So we've seen customers using the same frequency, like central frequencies on the same tower. They are getting into the trouble because they don't have the, mm, uh, the proper frequency reuse setup. And I'm not, I'm not blaming the customer because, okay, I'm new. How do I know, right? But that, that's the way how you can learn this, right? Go to the, to the support and uh, we have some documents, we can share it and uh, we, we have material uh, that we can advise how to solve issues. And some of those issues, they are that straightforward, like how to do the frequency reuse, how to set up the uh, transmit receive level on the AP so you don't have the self-interference of all the subscribers and things like that, that are completely unrelated to the new product, to the mm, specific issues, Um, new customers, please go to support. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's just, you know, every time, and it's really easy to say, well, I saw this guy on the internet had a problem, so I must be having the same problem. This stuff doesn't work, right? Well, and maybe that is the case, or maybe, you know, you're having a problem because X, Y, or Z, right? So you need to kind of run through the process and figure out where, where the actual disconnect actually is if you're having a problem. If and, I were pay like a single dollar every time I've heard always the same issue, it's never not the same. It's never the same. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, from a tech background my whole life. Yeah. They're like, hey, I got the same thing. I mean, I guess it's the same thing as like when you're sick, you go to WebMD and you're like, well, I've got cancer. And I'm like, no, you just oh, yeah, have yeah. a little boobie, <laughs> right? right? So it's easy to jump to conclusions. But, um, and I guess to sort of wrap things up here. So, you know, you guys have been super busy. I mean, you've been obviously super busy on this platform for a while, but I think this would be a good point to really sort of address, uh, you know, where, where the next steps are, you know, the last major release was for the AFC and stuff. Um, you know, there's some performance enhancements. I think that, uh, are definitely coming. People are looking for, seems to be the most vocal question. There's a couple of key mm-hmm. areas. So there's performance enhancements and then there's the, the feature additions, you know, roll out of things like Emu Mimo and stuff like that. So, you know, what of that, um, do you want to comment on, can comment on, uh, we'll have to filter out as needed <laughs> in the back end here, but no, it's all good. Mm, so. Uh, right now we are doing, uh, the alpha testing of the 5.8 firmware, uh, with a couple customers. The, the main, uh, the main improvement is the beamforming and the, the transmit beamforming transforms into six additional DB, um, on the five gigahertz because it's eight chains and it transforms into potentially three additional db on the uh 4x4 and 6 gig so it's it's a very nice improvement it will decrease the overall noise because you are still focusing the power in a specific uh, area so it is reducing the overall noise that that's that's a plus and you are getting additional uh, one or two levels of modulations in the downlink so that, that's one thing, and the, it improves the the overall performance of the system. And uh, again, one level of modulation, it's or even two levels of modulation in five gig, it's nothing to sneeze at. Um, so the the other thing that we are doing besides the beamforming is yeah, overall performance improvements. That's on, that is on our top priority list and you will see the incremental so there is no one silver bullet that uh, change it from 0 to 100 or 0 to 60 Um, oh you left out the the fix everything button you left that out yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) Um, 
we we've been thinking kind of a uh, long time ago in the EPMP 1000 days to add like uh, make me happy button like an Easter egg, <laughs> make me happy button on the UI. Uh, oh, I miss all so, the weird. Uh, you guys used to have all those weird uh, like error pages and stuff like that. I'm like, oh, I kind of miss uh, old, that old school stuff, you know? That's right. So. Uh, uh, that, that that's the uh, that's the second big thing. So improvements, and uh, it will be ongoing sets of uh, performance improvements. And by the way, uh, it's nothing new, and it's not unique about Cambium or EPMP or anything like that. Um, I think I've spent last at least fifteen years working on different radios, and I I've seen it all. Meaning all the all the other companies, it's it's always the same story. So the, there is a platform; it released and then it improves uh, and it ages uh, well as uh, as wine over the years, right? So when when it was EPMP three thousand, we over the years there there were improvements for the three thousand, right, uh, to the one that you know today. The same is the plan with the uh with the 4000 series so we will improve it uh, we will add new features like the uh, beam forming uh like all the under the hood improvements to make the whole system faster uh we will we are working on the multi-user mimo uh which is uh, coming this autumn or this fall um then uh that is going to be another significant thing and the good thing is that it will be way better than the EPMP 3000. Uh, uh, I don't want to o- overpromise right now or spoil the, <laughs> uh, the, the, the surprise, but uh, on 3000, we've been limited uh, under the hood, the architectural limitations of the, of the chipsets and overall under the hood uh, system was uh, limited in terms of how much gain you can get from the multi-user MIMO, especially in like, wider channels, like 40 megahertz. Um, and with the with this generation, we don't have this limitation. So it, it, sh- it, should, be, it should work uh, way better than on 3000, the multi-user MIMO. Uh, so that, that's the other thing. And uh, in slightly longer distance uh, after the multi-user MIMO, there, will, there, there are improvements around the uh, uplink multi-user MIMO. And many can say, oh, I don't care about uplink that much. That is less about the uplink itself as the, as the data, but we do have a lot of uh, uh, technical information like acknowledgements and uh, other management packets going in the uplink as well. Um, that, that are coming in the uplink. So overall, it will improve the latency and improve the <clears throat> the quality uh, of the link, like SLAs and jitter and stuff like that, uh, even if you don't use uh, uplink actively. So that, that's the other big thing in the, in the pipeline. Um, the, the other feature that I personally very, uh, I think it will be very useful and can be used widely. So the what we what we see right now that, and we kind of covered it. Everybody are trying to use wider channels because of the bandwidth demand. So the 40s, the new 20, and etc. And we are seeing people trying to use 80 megahertz and 5 gig, although it's very crowded. But again, for the shorter uh, links, because the bandwidth demand, people trying to go to the wider channels. And the problem with the wider channels in the current state of EPMP, that we use symmetric bandwidth in the downlink and uplink. So when you do the 80 megahertz, we, we are using 80 megahertz in the uplink as well. So all the SMs. And the main challenge with this is the interference on the AP. The, the majority of interference 
that's on the AP side because it sits and typically, especially with the sector antennas, it can hear the interference from the whole sector. Uh, and it sits on the high side, so it can collect it from all over around. And it can hear very well other APs on the same tower. So it, it's the, it, it is challenging to find the clean channel for the uplink. And what we are planning to do is to do the asymmetric channels. So you can do use 80 megahertz in the downlink and 40 or 20 in the uplink. So you don't have you can blast your 80 megahertz in the downlink because you have this clean spectrum on the SM side. Uh, but use 20 and 40 in the uplink, and it will improve the overall uh, again the quality of experience for your end customer because. Uh, it will be way more resilient to the noise in the uplink. All the acknowledgements and the uplink management will be with zero loss. So it will improve the overall uh, link quality and stability. That that's the other thing that is coming. So so it seems like I mean there's obviously a lot of new features or new techniques that you guys are using mm -hmm. in this platform that uh, weren't in the old platform. I mean, it It still seems like the development cycle for this platform is taking a lot longer than previous platforms took to mature. You know, is, is that because of all these new features that are being planned for the future? I mean, is there, are there some technical, uh, you know, uh, stumbles here with, you know, what the platform is capable of doing that's taking so long? Manpower, I mean, there's probably only so much you could say wearing the shirt mm -hmm. you're wearing, you know, but I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, help people understand maybe a little bit of where some of this is coming from, you know? Mm. So, um, with each and every generation, and I, I believe it's universal in the technology world, right? So, like, 30 years back, when we've been looking at the any software um, uh, back in the days, I was playing a lot of video games, obviously. And uh, the the video games, like 30 years back, it can be a video game written by one person. And it can be considered a very sophisticated game by that time. So going further, the technology, uh, the complexity of the overall technology is increasing. And it's all over the place. Take your phones, right? Again, the phones 30 years back was developed by one two-person team. Uh, right now, we have thousands. And it's overall. It, it's not only about radios and it's not only about Cambio. So long story short, yes, the, the technology, the complexity of the technology is increasing. And I guess exponentially in general, the amount of lines of code that we are dealing with uh, grown exponentially from last 10 years since EPMT 1000. So just the amount of the code grew exponentially um, and as well as complexity overall. So yes, it, it takes longer uh, to get meaningful progression. And again, it's not... Mm. by any means unique to Cambium. It's overall in the in the industry. And that that's why we probably will not see a lot of new vendors coming over in, into the space because it's getting more and more expensive. Uh, the, pr the entry price is becoming higher and higher uh, to do anything substantial yeah no, i it, it that makes sense you just can't get like a, a reference board from somewhere and uh slap a, a, a an open package <laughs> on it and just create a whole new thing i mean come on man it's a yeah piece of cake. just 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 go to uh you know some trade show in asia and pick a board and say i'm a you radio can manufacturer in the, now. for the trial in the in the comments yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll put a link here in our yeah comment yes. section uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of really crazy stuff too. And it, you know, it's not just like, this is not all your software that you're dealing with too. I mean, obviously yeah. you're having to deal with stuff from Qualcomm and you know, what they've got going on and stuff like that. So I'm sure it presents. Even look at the Linux kernel itself. 
Everybody using no, Linux kernel, no, right? And to. the size of the Linux kernel, it's growing again exponentially. It's just just the code base itself. Um, so yeah, you're you're absolutely right. That's that's uh, that's even the third party and like open source code uh, that we're dealing with. It's definitely not easy. Oh yeah, and uh, j- j- probably to to end up at some uh, even future like roadmaps and plans. Uh, you mentioned about the like reference boards and stuff. Uh, so we we do the uh, we already started with the Wi-Fi seven. So although it's kind of far away, uh, but we already started with the Wi-Fi seven uh, development. Uh, and the the most exciting thing in the Wi-Fi seven world is the MLO. That you can do, and uh, for the ones who who doesn't know, there's the multi-link operation when you can do uh, two carriers, uh, or one in five gig, another one in six gig, or maybe even two in six gigahertz, like independent carriers, and aggregate them. Uh, and that, that that's the one big thing for the next generation. Uh, of EPMP and the beauty of it that you can still do it with the price of EPMP so y- y- it will not grow up through the roof and not to be very uh, tremendously expensive so what's the exact date that you're going to commit to having all that ready <laughs> um, <laughs> that we will sign your yeah, name to not. and put on <laughs> and backwards come over to Wispapalooza presentation and can be uh, okay. how we call it uh, open house okay which is not that far away, which is scary yeah. to think about, right? <laughs> so, oh, cool stuff. Cool stuff for sure. So, well, we've covered a, a lot of ground here. Uh, I think we've got our, our time in, kind of addressed everything that, you know, the nitty gritty on the AFC, I think is super important that people understand a little bit more behind the, the scene as to what's going on and talked about your stuff and where things are. So I feel good. Uh, is there anything in closing you would like to sign off to uh, a message to your fans out there or not? I mean, uh, where, if someone where the mustache if, go, well, you see, he's getting more sad kind of a mustache uh, going down, seeing the, the Facebook posts recently. Uh, uh, but on a serious note, I I really appreciate what what the WIS community is doing for EPMP, and we are trying to, um, to commit to our message. And uh, I was... Not joking when I, I typically say that EPMP is like E for everyone. Um, I truly mean it. We, at least, uh, again, every time in the team, we we think about the customer and the customer is the king. And if the customer is upset, he, even mm, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why the customer is upset. Uh, customer is always right, and uh, that's why we would like to hear. We would like to hear, preferably through the systematic source of feedback, like support uh, tickets. But we would like to hear from you, and uh, we are committed to uh, to meet your high standards. I guess that 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 that's my overall message, and that's how we've been doing it over the years. With the again, with the one thousand, with the two thousand, three thousand. And again, uh, for the audience who saw us for a long time, you know how it was uh, working, and uh, it's uh, it, it it stays the same. And probably last but not least, I, I I've seen some uh, funny messages that we are like the R and D team is disappearing, or that we are uh, we are not here. No. Uh, it's still the same team, and we are uh, we, are, we are here, and we are we 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 are heavily working on the new exciting stuff uh, for the for the industry overall. Well, that's excellent. And then, um, uh, what's the best way if someone's looking to get in touch with you, uh, or not? Maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 Is there no, any no, method, so any place you would like to share some information where people could find you? 
so the, the 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 best message probably will be an email but uh yeah i i'm on facebook if you like facebook case um you, you can text me but i the the odds are i will ask you to send the tech support file to my email anyway <laughs> um so and yeah i can openly leave my email so probably you can find it in the comments very good, very good. Well, we really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today, being open and honest, and um, really good info. So we really appreciate it, man. I guess, Thank Tassos, you. Thank you. Um, where can the good people out there find us if they're looking for us? Absolutely, yeah. You can find us on social media. So all over Facebook and all the WIS groups, uh, you can find us on, on our forum, rfelab.com, and of course, our website, rfelements.com. And until we talk to you people again sometime in the future, uh, be good, and we'll see you later. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thank you.